I'd just like to answer your question by harking back to Albert's rallying call at the beginning of the Congress. <coughs> and that was to say that successful change is a combination of framing, timing, and networks. And so during the course of this week, Sorry. in our track... No, it's not, not on. Here. No. Doesn't sound on. Try another one and do a do-over from the beginning. So the question is, what have I learned from my track um, this week? And so I answered that by harking back to Ahmed's rallying call at the beginning of the Congress. And that was to say that successful change is a, mixer, is a mixture of framing, timing, and networks. And so in our user rights track, we have focused almost exclusively on that, framing, timing, and networks. And we've gone a step further and spoken quite a lot about research, what to research and how to disseminate that research. And at certain stages, we have combined with the openness track, and that's been mutually beneficial. So we've taken some of their methodologies, for example, the myth-busting one, and we quite like that. Um, the way we frame our arguments is very different, but there's been a lot of cross-fertilization, and that's been very useful. Great. Thank you. Which was this uh, issue of one size not fitting all. And it's a really... Um, interesting challenge that I think has come up throughout the week, that on one level we want meta-level research, we want to be able to gain from various sites, but on the other hand we need to do locally contextual research. And so I think that there is something to think about in terms of how we set research agendas that are both locally specific and have meta-level questions, and how we set out to do that at the outset so that we are able to compare and standardize where possible um, at the same time as answering specific questions. But it's also struck me that one issue that has come up throughout the week in the discussions and the sessions I've been in have been the question of business models and sustainability. And I think in terms of research agenda, that has to be one of the issues that we look at, and particularly the role of the private sector um, as we move into a services model in the openness space particularly. Um, and then the other thing that I've been struck by during the week has been um, a, a, a call, a, an acknowledgement of the need for South-South networks. And this has come up um, quite spontaneously in different spaces as well as during sessions. So people have been very pleased that the global networks and the kind of European, Australian nexus has been drawing uh, developing countries into the conversation, but there's also been a sense that I've gained that there needs to be specific South-South research agenda and uh, discussion. Simply put, I think the, uh, the, uh, the number of participants um, and uh, um, the, the nature of the discussion actually frames that quite well. Because in reality, we have, in the TK stream, we have, uh, we have had discussion, whilst it's still continuing, uh, we've had discussion at the international level, we've had discussion at the national level and the local level, and the representatives uh, of the TK track have been from now uh, around 10 countries, or possibly more, from Africa, um, have been representatives of communities themselves. And so what has been critical is to, uh, when talking about uh, TK at the, certainly at the, the global and local levels, is to make sure that those messages are being uh, quite cyclical, I think. And that is exactly what has happened over the last couple of days. This will uh, obviously help in setting an agenda, which uh, we're continuing to do over the next uh, uh, day and a half or so, but setting the agenda over the next few years as to how this discussion maintains localised, maintains grounded, um, to the context you know, in Africa that is coming <laughs> definitely from our track, yeah. and that's the reality. There, uh, there is no one-size-fits-all, uh, and what has been great about this track in, in terms of the critique that has been provided uh, is that I think there is general understanding in going forward and looking at the IP system relevant to TK that uh, there is a big balancing act which needs to be had. You know? um, and coming from a community's perspective or you know, business perspective, there are different issues that need to be taken into account. Um, and wider society, do we make things in terms of traditional knowledge free for all? Uh, but what about rights of communities? And of course, this has been a discourse for, for, uh, for some time now. But it's nice to, at least we, we have tried to focus on the TK track with some specificity 
what are the laws and methodologies now being used to uh, essentially um, take into account uh, these you know, divergent, divergent themes and, uh, and needs. In terms of the um, overlaps and the divergences, there have been some interesting discussions around the opens, the open access, open education resources, open source. And I think it's become clear that there are differences between those opens as well as commonalities. And to go back to your point about research, I think this is something we should be interrogating. There's been quite quick and easy um, suggestions that you can move, for example, between an open source business model into an open education business model that's based on the same premises. But of course it raises quite important questions when the freemium model means that the actual scaffolding of learning is paid for but the content is free. So it's not a straightforward matter and I think that uh, an interrogation of where the opennesses do diverge in quite important ways needs to be taken into account as well as where they are similar. So uh, I wouldn't speak about this as a divergence in our group, but it's kind of an unresolved question. Uh, and in some respects, the enforcement issues have run through a number of the tracks very prominently, especially the user rights track. I mean, TPP, uh, for all its defects, has the virtue of being one of the clearest documents in recent time around which to develop an alternative, a set of alternatives, uh, at least as far as copyright goes. Uh, and as a result, we tried to structure our track around things that we didn't think would be as strongly foregrounded in the user rights track. And so there's a kind of, I think, unfinished dialogue between the uh, things that we focused on in the enforcement track, which tend to, tended to be the, uh, more the social and institutional context in which enforcement happens. So, uh, you know, insofar as user rights is conceived primarily in legal terms as a series of expanded limitations and exceptions or reconceptualization of things that are in copyright law, uh, there are a lot of other I issues that have a direct bearing on how enforcement is conducted, how it's experienced by the masses of people that <coughs> infringe on a daily basis or regular basis. And so there are questions of boundaries. Uh, you know, things like uh, abusive contract terms, things like uh, uh, denial of net neutrality uh, with respect to mobile applications, <coughs> things, things like uh, private copyright enforcement through mass copyright trolling operations. I mean, these are the things that, uh, in some respects, translate very directly and easily into large-scale consumer opposition, but that don't necessarily have a place in copyright law or the reform of copyright law. So there's a question of boundaries that I think we've left unaddressed for now, but I think that will come up as we continue to talk about what constitutes a user rights agenda. Great. Thank you. To depict this as a divergence might be too strong a term, but we, um, in the user rights track, spent some time yesterday talking about the words that we use and in framing our, our arguments. And so it was quite interesting because um, there are words that we love as this community that we love to use, that we all understand, but once you take it out into the advocacy space and you perhaps use it with the policy audience, those words are not necessarily welcomed. And so just the, the discussions around those words were very interesting. As I say this, I remember the exchange that went on between Peter and Alec over the use of the word, the commons. That's quite interesting. And so um, all I'd want to say about that is as we go forward in, in our future work, it's really important to be careful about the words we use and to always remember that what we are saying is not what the other person is hearing. Um, a friend of mine likes to say that she is responsible for what she says and not what I hear. But in this space, we are responsible for what the others hear. So we've got to be really careful. There were certainly some divergences. But I think one of the things that's been incredibly um, clarifying of, after the last few days is the degree to which there is uh, unanimity uh, against a very intense set of um, challenges and threats that are actually posed to the degree to which medicine has been made available and open um, and, uh, and uh, available to communities at low cost through generic production, we are seeing at nearly every level direct assault on those, on the words, on the concepts, and on the ways in which they, they are being implemented. Whether that is um, you know, at the WTO level, down to patent level, down to data rules, down to the buy-up of companies, um, down to the training, and this comes in part to what, uh, to what Joe was speaking of, that I think is a real moment of, um, 
of convergence that we could maybe explore further here at the Congress, which is the enforcement piece. Because one of the things that we're seeing is that even when we win at every single level and we're able to insert the agenda of an open, free access uh, to medicines, what we're seeing is that the judges and the patent examiners have been trained by uh, governments in the North and undermine all of that concept. So I think one, one kind of clarifying thing that we've gotten out is, is just how big the pushback is from the other side, from what we've won, and that might be something that we could explore going forward. But I have noticed that the discourse from the South, particularly in the African discourse, is very different from the discourse that you hear from other parts of the South. And um, to me, that isn't uh, a big problem. It's, it's really great that we're here in this one room and you got to listen to um, the African voices who perhaps frame things quite differently from others in the Global South. So I think that um, it's been quite useful to be together in this one space to listen to each other as we talk and perhaps to, in the future, come together, like Laura said, with combined research agendas and perhaps um, united positions going forward and a unified discourse, perhaps. I do have to say, though, it is an absolute pleasure to be in a conference where there is such a sense of shared values in the sense of if it's about IP in the public domain, you are immediate immediately a particular group of people. And that's been, that's not about North and South, that's about a particular value set. And, and I don't think one can assume anything on the basis of where one comes from about what one is standing for. And that's been a real pleasure. In fact, where I, I found more of the interesting differences are between the people who are, are advocacy, advocacy people and researchers. And I think that's an interesting tension um, advocacy keep at, at, why am I struggling with this word? <laughs> advocacy people want research to come out with outcomes and findings that will support their message. Researchers have to find out what they're going to find out. And I think this creates a tension. You can't have a research question that says what are the benefits. You have to have a research question that says what are the benefits and the problems. So I think that um, in terms of bringing together groups lawyers and advocates and researchers. There's some interesting work to be done about um, enabling those conversations. Thank you. Uh, I, I just wanted to comment on this uh, dichotomy between advocacy and research, and perhaps introduce a new term, which is policy research. In the world of academic research, the gold standard is when the research object is unaffected by research methodology then we are very pleased. But if you told somebody who does policy research that your research methodology has agency and can actually change the research object, then why would they give up on that potential that research methodology has? So the marriage between advocacy folk and researchers should be such a marriage. We want to get big pharma. What should we do? And the research methodology itself can result in undermining the credibility, legitimacy uh, uh, of big pharma. This is a possibility. That is the role of research in a community like this. Mm. Asking a pure academic question just for the sake of knowledge, knowledge for knowledge's sake, might not be particularly relevant in this network. I'm saying that the research uh, activity has to serve the advocacy agenda. What I was making a criticism of is that we have to be prepared to find things that might not suit our agendas. That's what I was, that, well, that was my point. Is we have to go in ac ac accepting that by doing research we might find outcomes that are unanticipated or not exactly pleasant or not what we want to hear and that's also part of the job. So, well, <laughs> a comment from um so I think for the access to medicines track and community, um, a consistent challenge is that not, not everyone who, who is, it's become evident that not everyone who is here has had an opportunity to absorb the lessons, the arguments, and, and the counter arguments of the access to medicines movement and thereby, thereby come around to the uh, fundamental morality of the cause. A few of our fri uh, friends from the digital rights community attended the screening last night of fire and the blood and spoke to us after about how their eyes had been completely open and they got it now and sort of wanted to, um, wanted to help out in a more a robust fa fashion. And of course that's gonna be true for all of our, all of our uh, disparate 
movements that we can't sort of know everything all the time. But I, but I think for us, it sort of pointed to uh, what I think is an underlying purpose of the annual Congress for which we can do somewhat more, which is work on sort of developing a language, a lexicon, common language that fully encapsulates all the movements in the room. It is still, a, the Congress I think still fundamentally uses a language that's principally derived from copyright law. The language of limitations and exceptions doesn't, doesn't fully translate, I think, to all, the, to all the movements that are in the room, even though language of openness and access certainly does and, uh, and is very productive. I just think that it's something that we could uh, work a bit uh, more on uh, in the future because fundamentally we're all gathered here because there, there is a counter movement to, to what we represent in this room and they've been building for the last 30 years an industry alliance between Pfizer and Hollywood and so on and an ideological concept of intellectual property which doesn't actually exist in law, right? What we have is patents and copyrights and trademarks and and we represent a very a fundamentally different vision of how to organize the knowledge economy in the 21st century and it's going to affect the right to health and it's going to affect creativity and innovation production and all these uh, all these uh, distinct causes. And it's, I just think it's very important that we continue to come back uh, to that objective of building the common language and common movement and uh, sort of see it from that perspective. If you go to Washington DC right now where a lot of bad policies are made for the whole world Every member of Congress has some rudimentary understanding of, of the ideology of intellectual property. Uh, and very, very, and some, a few, understand that there need to be limitations on it in certain areas, that it can go too far. But no one has a counter narrative. No one has a sense, really, of this positive agenda or the idea of an open knowledge economy and how that can completely transform the society in which we live over coming decades. I think that's a big part of what we're here to build and we should be making sort of consistent reference back to it. It would be impossible not to answer that by just simply referring back to, uh, you know, a, a little over a decade ago when, you know, many of the organizations and folks in this room first became aware of some of the, the depths to which um, the pharmaceutical industry or the, the extent to which the pharmaceutical industry was willing to go in order to protect an intellectual property idea so far as to put uh, Nelson Mandela's name as the first, uh, first uh, litigant to which they were suing um, in order to prevent the importation or production of generic drugs. And that, I think, bring, it's, being here in Cape Town, having the Treatment Action Campaign and Doctors Without Borders, MSF, as core uh, leaders in the track made for a very different kind of, um, kind of Congress. And one of the things that came front and center was the, the patent reform campaign that's going on here in South Africa. And it's worth, I think, everyone in the room thinking for a little bit about what we can leave behind, what we can continue to be engaged in going forward. Because right now, the leaders in South Africa are facing a rather uphill battle. Um, it's worth noting that uh, there was a, a, a meeting held with some government officials who say it will be years before a pro-public interest uh, patent law might even see the, the, um, see the light of day and that there is substantial pushback against that. And so one thing we might think about at this, at this Congress is, you know, can we help generate the knowledge and the advocacy push and the stream of evidence that can help show the South African government and the Brazilian government and the Ugandan government and the Kenyan government and the Zambian government and the Brazilian or the Chinese government and the Malawian government, all of which are doing patent reform efforts right now, that actually there is a substantive way to do a patent law that is Southern driven and that is public interest driven, um, that we do substantial patent examination, right? One of the things we heard is we can't possibly do patent examination because we don't have the, the knowledge and the content. So these kinds of things are exactly what I think this Congress can actually add to the discussion and help support people that are doing the frontline policy work. I mean, just, just to add, I mean, that, uh, the comment we heard before uh, from the general from Cameroon, um, evidence we've had some wonderful conversations in the TK track, but the, uh, I, think, I think some of those realities uh, that have come out, if we're talking about research and advocacy, in reality, I don't think research as a term actually came up too much in our track um, because it was, a, it was a connection 
between realities, lived realities and experiences on the ground with communities and connecting that to, say, policy and advocacy around that as well. Uh, and I think that, you know, um, I, I think that uh, was one of the importances um, of the track as well. And at the same time, um, with a focus on traditional knowledge, not only on, uh, in the intellectual property paradigm, but at the same time, um, connecting it to the discussions that are happening at environmental law. Um, and so I, I guess that, uh, that bridge has been trying to be formed as well, cause, which is very important if we're looking at TK uh, across the street. But just to, to add on to what Matt is saying, um, in a lot of these places, it's not just patent law reform that's being conducted. They're, also, they're reforming the whole IP system here in South Africa. And I think that's probably the case in a number of other countries. And I know that we feel... Um, as a movement, you know, we, we have to push very hard against um, industries' interests and a number of other private interests. And if we can get some people from the other tracks, um, you know, people that are looking at copyright law, that, that are looking at traditional knowledge, which is another big issue in South Africa, um, because all of these things are going through legal reform processes, the more civil society, academics, researchers, people that we can get behind these efforts, uh, the stronger we're going to be and the more successful I think we're going to be. This leads me to, to answer this by recounting um, a remark I had Walter Park make earlier on because he's doing really exciting research with Jeremy Malcolm. Um, who else is involved, by the way? Somebody else is involved? Mike Palmetto. Sorry, Mike. Um, so they're doing really interesting research to generate empirical research. And I had Walter make the comment that um, Jeremy said, look, I, I don't know what your findings will be, but... It doesn't matter, we need those findings and then we can use them going forward. I can't actually spot Walter in the audience, but if someone knows where he is, I'd like to put him on the spot and ask him to speak a bit more about that. Is Walter Park here? Walter Park? Okay, he's, he's not here, but I think that's exactly what the professor is saying. We're going to research without knowing what the outcome will be, but whatever the outcome is, it's useful for us because we then base our arguments on it. And I th uh, there were certainly issues that the group identified as requiring either more research or more coordination of research. There's a lot of work uh, happening now or beginning to happen around intermediary liability, which of course is going to be very important in the next round of uh, national copyright laws, next round of trade negotiations. There's going to be enormous pressure uh, to better define and potentially restrict the, uh, the safe harbor or the, the terms under which intermediary, intermediaries uh, can escape liability for copyright infringement. That may or may not occur over the networks. So that's, that's clearly an issue on which there will be greater coordination moving forward. Because there's, a lot of, there are a lot of, there's a lot of parallelism in the projects that was described. Uh, there's certainly some huge gaps, certainly uh, echoing that around the, the technical assistance question. I think everybody f felt that uh, you know, much of uh, what influences copyright, again, it just happens outside the, the formal channels of what's legal, illegal, what kinds of liability are, liability are at stake. There's an enormous apparatus of training and acculturation of professionals and officials at all levels of these, uh, of these uh, IP systems that, uh, you know, despite the achievement of certain kinds of diversification of the goals at the high level of uh, the WHO or WIPO, uh, still are dominated by industry groups or uh, professional professionals that have been assimilated to industry viewpoints and that reproduce themselves at other levels. So that, that's, that's clearly something where um, there will need to be a lot more attention in the next few years, I think, if we're to seriously contest and open up those processes. And just the third thing I'd, I'd note is that um, we discussed the role of social movements going forward and what some of the lessons were from some of the recent successful social movements or would have would, would appear to be successful social movements, ACTA, SOPA, uh, especially. And, um, well, two things. One is that it, it's clear that there's a, there's a huge amount of contingency at stake in these, in these victories, and also in the losses, but that there, that there are, you know, we, it, it's, it's easy to think of the last couple of years in terms of momentum on some of the copyright issues. But in fact, things happen or don't happen according to an astonishingly complex array of personalities and things that are, that are really outside our control at present. I mean, they're um, highly contingent events 
election years, things things that um, we don't yet have the we don't yet have the momentum to ignore. <laughs> uh, and so there's a, there, there was a I think a lot of scope at the end of our discussion for a much more detailed account of what those political contingencies are. So the the Mexico Mexico um, uh, rejection of ACTA was one that uh, we've spent some time on. The, the ACTA process itself is, was the anti-ACTA movement itself was very complicated. And in each case, again, the, you know, the, the, the focus of a lot of the activism was divorced from a lot of the detail of what the proposals around copyright law were and had a lot to do instead with the perception of democratic deficits. And so if, if just to Joe, could you hold the mic just slightly closer? Sorry, to am I, can, can you hear me? Okay. For the interpreters okay. next door, sorry. Uh, and it, it's clear that these democratic deficits are you know, a kind of unifying theme, and there's certainly one that bridges the activist community and a lot of the political communities at the national level who don't want to feel excluded from major decisions around domestic policy. Uh, and that, too, is a subject that really hasn't received a lot of research attention. Uh, there are some notable uh, exceptions, but it's a, there's, a huge, there's huge scope for more work on those issues, and that's something uh, I think came out very strongly in the course of our track. This particular question of the democratic deficit is something that came up again and again, and I, I, I do wonder if this is something we should put front and center for future conversations, especially across tracks, because this is absolutely what we're seeing across government, um, and that you know, each and every, at each and every level, when we see um, pro-access policies being implemented, we see a move out of those forums. And I think some of what Susan Sell was speaking about at the beginning of the session really helped frame some of the conversations that we had about what are the forums, et cetera. Um, and I think, you know, that, that really led into, it, it did in part actually lead into a, a, a research agenda question. So I should clarify, we, we had uh, a substantial conversation and, and we actually leave with a, a set of questions and research questions as well as a set of uh, policy questions. And they really broke down into kind of three questions. One was, you know, what's happening right now? So this means everything from what does it actually cost to, uh, to research and bring to market a, a medicine versus what we're told it costs? Um, the second piece is really what are the effects? And so people started talking about and, and really looking at co effects on health systems, effect on government policy, et cetera. And then the third piece is really what are the alternatives? And so this is another kind of research area that many in the room are at work at. So what if we de-link uh, research and development from the price of medicines? This is a core piece that actually I think could be a better and bigger thread throughout the entire Congress um, and is a, an essential research agenda. So we have a substantial one that we would welcome more researchers for. Thank you. Would at you the like risk to... of speaking again, I mean, I think we, we definitely left, uh, and we leave, in fact, with several very, very helpful kind of plans of action. One on the network side, which is, you know, I think the opportunity to have the Congress here in South Africa and to have this many uh, leading African researchers and civil society and activists together has really opened a space that hasn't, uh, hasn't existed before. And so that networking is something that I know people are carrying forward uh, very intentionally. And there were conversations explicitly about what would it take to actually see some of the core medicines actually available in countries and what kinds of networks would be needed to create the space for that to happen. Um, and then I think, you know, I, I've mentioned the patent reform piece, but I think that that's one, one piece that will carry very strongly forward um, and where a research agenda and a policy agenda come, come very much together because creating the set of obvious pro-access uh, policies that could go into an IP policy and then being able to share that across um, is one model that's, that's absolutely coming out of this Congress. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. I, I came late so I, I didn't attend everything but since I attended I learned a lot from, from the presentations. I attended two streams, both, uh, one on the traditional knowledge and the other on the user. But let me say a few things, uh, if you allow me. Uh, if I, you may, but if you could say them briefly. Please. Briefly, yeah. I will be very, very brief. Yeah. Um, first, just a practical thing on networks. Um, <coughs> we are also involved in a, a network here in Africa. We have built up something called GlobalX, the global network on the economics of innovation, learning, uh, building, uh, innovation, and so on. Yeah. 
competence building systems. So I like you to, next year is the 12th conference. It will be in Addis Ababa, uh, Ethiopia, in October, on October, between October 27, 31. I like most of you to kind of participate in this because you are absolutely linked to, to that network. Some of the things you're doing, they, they do it. So there is also something called Africa Leaks, uh, Meta Leaks, all kinds of networks like this. And India Leaks, uh, Asia Leaks, um, uh, Sika Leaks. So we've been tried to create these networks which actually deal with some of the issues you do. And I like you to network with them. That's uh, number one. On the substantive th side, I think we need to think of linking, uh, creating knowledge exchange, scientific knowledge with traditional knowledge. There must be some way of linking what Bruno Latour called the modern constitution. The, the, even the sciences, the natural sciences and the engineering sciences with the social and economic sciences. And we need also to do something fundamental in terms of thought, <laughs> thought uh, reform or thought, radical, radical thought reform. We must test the epistemic virtue of everything we do. In other words, the thinking we do, the research we do, is, is just taking on, trying to identify, find out what is going on. But we, we need to step out and say, what is also feasible? For example, on the legal side, we talk about punitive justice. How do we punish? How do we do this? How about restorative justice? Rehabilitative justice. In Africa, we created beautiful justice systems. I came from a country in Ethiopia where they have Afrasata, which is an extraordinary system when so I grew I'm, up. I'm going to have to ask so, you to, yeah. to wrap up. No, I, I just like, I like thinking, radical thinking, of saying how do we create a society and a world of caring and sharing, and not just saying copyright, violation of copyright. How do we measure this? How do we fight this? No, 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 no. I like you to think bigger, a big ambition, Thank a big you. vision, a new world and a new imagination. Uh, uh, that's Mandela. Thank you. Madiba. Point taken. We have I think the original <laughs> question which triggered this exchange was one about like, concrete ideas about collaboration in the next 12 months or so. Yes. And in that regard, we had, not really for the track, but we had like, one of the breakout sessions, we had a very productive, fairly internal session with people working, who are working on the different reviews and consultations on copyright going on around the world. And I think there is some commitment within that group to share experiences clearly in between, and hopefully we can report some success on that, but that is, there's work going on in Australia which seems to be two, one and a half years ahead, and that's very useful for the work now starting in Europe, and hopefully that can feed into someone else's work soon. So I just wanted to highlight that. Great. Perhaps I'll just kick off. Um, you know, I was quite eager to, to start, and then you said, of which you're proud, and then I thought, ah, okay. <laughs> I'm exceedingly proud of everybody and all of the work that they've done, but that wasn't really what I was going to pitch. You know, I wanted to hark back to an earlier question that you posed. First of all, you asked about research commitments going forward, and then you spoke about networking. And so I wanted to make a pitch at that stage. And um, I just wanted to, once again, remind people that we do have this wonderful networking space, which is infojustice.org. And earlier on, um, Sean was just reminding me that this was the output of um, the first Global Congress. And it's still there. People are still using it. But we would like many more people to use it. So, you know, one idea that was suggested was perhaps we should have regional reporters, right? So somebody who logs on every once in a while and just updates everybody on what's happening in a particular region. And I think that the tracks could use that space quite effectively um, in that way. So not a direct answer, but a pitch for something else. Um, oh, yes. I, I mean, first of all, I think that uh, um, the partners that came together um, and the group of people that came together is, uh, is a wonderful thing in itself because we're really, uh, in part of this discussion, um, part of the aim was to hear the different views and whether it be people involved in different areas um, as I was saying before, access and benefit sharing, or, or whether it be strict IP, uh, whether your government, whether your indigenous personal local community representative, uh, member of business or research, everyone did come together for this discussion, um, looking to solve some of these bigger issues when we're talking about TK. And so that is something I think that uh, as a Congress it could be very proud of. Um, what some of our hopes would be is to continue that discussion, to continue the linkages, um, and as was mentioned before by Sohel, 
uh, ensure that it's not only those in the TK world. You know, we tend to think, and possibly in all the streams, but in TK, that uh, it is only TK <laughs> that we're talking about. But to see that cross-fertilization, as was, as was mentioned, and I think, you know, looking forward to, uh, to future Congresses as well, to uh, try and ensure that that happens, um, which would be, you know. I think for me, perhaps, one of the, the highlights I'd like to talk about now is the fact that we had this Global Congress back-to-back -back with the Open Air Conference. And that first session that we had earlier on, and we took some time to think about lessons that we'd learned from the way in which the Open Air Project frames its arguments, if any lessons could be drawn from that and perhaps um, taken forward into the Global Congress and vice versa. So for me, even the cross-fertilization at that stage between two different groupings of people sharing the same values, working in the same area, but at this one place uh, was really important for me. I think that's a big highlight for us all. So I, I will just abuse my holding of this microphone for a moment to ask, raise your hand if you've signed the declaration already. Thank you. Please sign it before you leave. So final concluding pieces. If you haven't, it's right there. Final concluding for me, I mean, I think where where we stand right now, I think, on access to medicines is it's interesting to, to hear from conversations in the hallways and conversations in other tracks to the extent, uh, the extent to which I think the access to medicines thinking and world has experienced in the policy sense um, what's probably coming in some places, right, from having success and then watching pushback, and then also has not yet reached where some of you all are, especially in thinking on openness and um, and alternative mechanisms and ways to think about these things. So I do think that the, in part the answer is for some more integration in our next, next go around. I think though we should hold up the things that we're proud of and I think one that I would highlight from, from the week is the degree to which on so many fronts people are using very effective arguments to actually have a holders of state power able to keep um, keep the public interest front and center. So recently when colleagues in Kenya were able to get their Supreme Court to strike down the anti-counterfeiting law using pro-human rights, pro-public health arguments, when recently the Indian Supreme Court took up arguments that come out of the movements of people living with HIV, that come out of the movements of, of people pushing open information and data, all of that reflects that when we get onto our terms, we win. And so I guess the question that I leave the Congress with in part is, how do we forum shift, to use Susan's term, to all of the, the spaces where we can win? How do we put the, um, the IP maximalist agenda instead in spaces where we know we are stronger and have the better arguments, rather than always being defensive in the wrong forums? Thank you. So when you're the fourth person to talk about what, what you're proud of, that uh, means other people have said what you were going to say. Um, so I'm going to start with one plea, which is something that's come out during the week, which is about open practices. And I think it links a little bit to what you were saying, Caroline, about communicating what you're doing as you're doing it. Um, and it takes expertise and it takes people. And I know it's something that some of the funders are very much in support of, which is around communication practices. And I think we've started to see some of that happening here. But I think we could do more to be sharing as we go and putting in place the expertise that enables open research, open advocacy to be shared as it happens in real time. So that's a plea from me. And then the thing I think that I have, I don't know if I'm proud of it, but I've certainly benefited from has been the sharing of arguments. Because when you bring together different groups as we have done here, we've all benefited enormously, I think, from those sharing of arguments and that's been incredibly valuable. Okay, well, I, I get to take the easy way out uh, being last, but it's also, I think, a very true way out for me, at least. I'm very proud of the Global Congress. <laughs> uh, I'm proud to have been involved in it. I'm, I'm grateful that we've managed to put on three of these, and each of them has gotten bigger and better and more diverse and, I think, richer. Um, I think it's borderline crazy, but also a source of pride that people are talking about extending it to five days now. <laughs> and integrating other kinds of... <laughs> and integrating other kinds of work that people think is important, but for which there's no clear forum. So there are other roles that this kind of convening can take on, whether that's other, you know, more 
uh, deeper dives into some of these issues, uh, training, uh, other kinds of sharing, other kinds of uh, group mobilization. Mm -hmm. And I'm enormously thankful that uh, all the complexities of these kinds of events keep getting resolved for this year. Uh, that has everything to do with Tobias, Jeremy, and Michelle and the other South African hosts. Uh, it's a good moment to thank them. I look forward to seeing this continue and continue to grow and integrate new uh, groups and communities and become more effective because that's ultimately the test of what this event is about. Does it make us more effective and uh, better as researchers, better, better as activists? I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you.